I'm missing that. Uh, <clears throat> all right. Thank you all for being here. This is the DAO's regularly scheduled Monday press conference in which we, we cover two topics ordinarily. The first topic, of course, is an update on gun violence from the prior week. The second topic today is a specific example of a success in the prosecution of a felon in possession of a firearm who was endangering others in the community on New Year's Eve by firing his weapon. Many of you may recall there was a press conference and there was quite a bit of activity both this year and last year around discouraging people from that kind of conduct. Well, Bashir Moore at this point is discouraged. He has been convicted of being a felon in possession of a firearm, section 6105. He's also been convicted of reck recklessly endangering others by his activity, reckless endangerment of another person and he will be facing sentencing in May. It turns out there's a little bit more to Mr. Moore. It turns out there's a little bit more background. And I guess it is unsurprising in light of the recklessness, in light of his possessing a firearm after having been convicted of a felony. But there is a little bit more to Bashir Moore. I'd like to acknowledge the stakeholders, staff, media who are here today. We have with us Robert Listenby, first assistant, first assistancy, first assistant, the Honorable Carolyn Engel Temin. We have ADA Joanne Pescator, who is the supervisor of our homicide and non-fatal shooting unit. We also have the Reverend Myra Maxwell, executive director of victim services, and Melanie Nelson, director of our CARES unit. And we have ADA Rebecca Steck, who has been with the DA's office since shortly after we took office here. Uh, a proud graduate of the University of Wisconsin Law School who is the attorney who successfully prosecuted Bashir Moore, which was not easy because no gun was recovered in the case involving Mr. Moore. Nevertheless, she succeeded in obtaining a conviction on these charges. And ADA Stack will be a little bit later, as well as Melanie Nelson. So let me turn first to some of the data around gun violence and what it is that occurred. Again, this is for March 19 through 25. There were seven homicides and 19 fatal shootings. There were 82 cases of violence. According to our possession of guns was 75,000 in the vast majority adequate. And if we take out the cases that were held without bail, which are usually cases involving homicide, the median cash bail set for violent gun offenses was 312500 Bear in mind that in nearly every one of those cases, we are seeking what is essentially a million dollars bail. And as bad as that is, 312500 it represents an increase over what we were doing a year and a half ago. Thank goodness. I would note that the seven homicides, which is obviously heartbreaking, is a little bit less than what we have experienced during certain points in the pandemic when we have ordinarily seen about 1.5 a day, five times seven days is 10.5, and there were seven. That is nothing to cheer about, however, because the reality is we are pretty close to where we were last year in terms of the total number of homicides. There are 100 and 20 homicides to date, March the 27th, increase. There were 19 non-fatal shootings, as I might have mentioned earlier. Overall, of the 115 gun-related incidents reported to the Philadelphia Police Department, last week there were 83 arrests made by the Police Department. Of the 83 arrests submitted to the DA's office for possible charging, there were 82 cases opened by the DA's office based upon those cases. I'd like to highlight a couple of specific incidents. 
three in particular. The first is a shooting incident Thursday, March the 24th at about 9.12 p.m. in the 6,000 block of Mulberry Street. An approximately 15-year-old white male shot once in the right side and once in the head. He was transported to Jefferson Torresdale Hospital by police. He passed away the next day. No arrest has been made at this time by the police department. This investigation remains ongoing. Anyone with information should contact PPD's shooting investigation group at 215-686-8270. That, of course, is the group that Commissioner Outlaw uh, originated recently, headed by Captain Johnny Walker. I was just on the phone with Captain Walker talking about a couple of things. Let me put it that way. Um, and we are delighted to see the hard and careful work that they're doing on this and many other cases. Second incident is a shooting incident, a non-fatal shooting on Sunday, March the 27th at about 5.53 p.m. in the 6,000 block of North 5th Street inside of the 7-Eleven in the 35th Police District. A Hispanic male about 23 years old was shot once in the right ankle. He was taken to Einstein where he was placed in stable condition. There is no arrest at this time. Anybody with information? Same group, 215-686-8270. The third one, shooting incident, is a homicide that occurred on Sunday, March the 27th at about 10 p.m. at 5650, 5650 Ridge Avenue in the Sunoco parking lot in the 5th Police District. An unresponsive black male was found on the highway with multiple gunshot wounds. He was pronounced at the scene by medics there were two scenes in the incident, one at 5650 Ridge Avenue and the 400 block of Kingsley Street. No arrest has been made at this time. Once again, the investigation is ongoing. Please provide information to the shooting investigation group at 215-686-8270. ADA Joanne Pescatore is here, as I stated earlier. She is the chief of the DA's Homicide and Non-Fatal Shooting Unit, and she will be available to answer at least limited questions regarding uh, these and possibly other incidents involving shootings. I think part of what this press conference stands for, in addition to making sure that we remain connected and we communicate about what is going on with gun violence, is it stands for accountability. Because we are here, in addition to reviewing last week's data, to talk about somebody getting convicted and facing a sentencing. And not just a sentencing, also facing a violation for having been on a prior period of supervision. We are talking about accountability. Don't believe the hype. Sometimes politics gets in the way of fact. This office is really good if you get locked up at getting you convicted for firing guns at other people, for firing guns in the air, for harming other people with guns. We will continue to report on the big picture and the little picture. But the little picture matters, and the little picture here is that day after day after day, very, very talented lawyers go to court, work very hard, and convict people who deserve to be convicted for pointing guns at other human beings and firing them. We will continue to push prevention as one of the best ways to make sure the next victimization does not occur, and we will continue to push modern enforcement including the use of forensics, which is woefully lacking in this city, despite having an excellent chief of our forensics unit in the Philadelphia Police Department. We will continue to push these things because it is what we do. At this time, I'd like to introduce Melanie Nelson, who is, of course, responsible for a very important aspect of what we do in prevention and also in terms of things necessary for us to be successful in holding people accountable and that is that the CARES unit, she supervises, cares for people. It takes care of them. Ms. Nelson. Good morning. CARES responded to six families, seven families, family members total during the week of 319 to 2022 to 325 2022, providing 21 services to those families. April is approaching. 
National Victims Rights Week is coming up. It's a tongue twister, I'm sorry. April 24th to April the 30th. The district attorney's office will be present. We asked that you hold those victims a little while longer. We ask that you hold those co-homicide survivors a little while longer. And during National Victims Rights Week, please join the Philadelphia District Attorney's Office. We will be there in Harrisburg. We care and we love you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Nelson. <clears throat> so I want to talk for a moment about the major trials unit within the DA's office. This is a unit currently headed under the effective leadership of ADA Liam Riley and ADA Dawn Holtz. I, I just want to make sure you understand my appreciation for the work that they are doing. We are fighting a very large backlog, certainly smaller than it might have been. We're not fighting a tsunami. We're just fighting a big wave of cases, but they are very serious cases, and this is an example of that. Those cases are placed in the hands of ADAs who go to court every day, prepare diligently, work hard, and achieve a remarkable level of success. And we are here now to talk about one such successful case. I'd like to call forward ADA Rebecca Steck to discuss her recent success in the case involving defendant Bashir Moore. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, so as DA Krasner said, my name is Rebecca Steck. I'm currently an assistant district attorney in the majors unit. Um, so last Thursday, I was in courtroom 902, and I was the prosecutor on a case against uh, Bashir, Bashir Smith. Excuse me. So the rough facts of this case is that it was New Year's Eve 2019. Officers McMahon and McCord from the 1st District, who I have to say a big thank you to for their wonderful and dedicated police work, were actually on an overtime shift to combat uh, gun violence and gun discharges on New Year's Eve in South Philadelphia. They heard uh, gunshots being discharged near the intersection of Point Breeze and Edding Terrace, so the 2100 block of Edding Terrace. They got out of their car. They looked down an alleyway with a yard in it on Philadelphia Housing Authority property, and they saw a group of young men, one of whom was the defendant, Bashir Smith, discharging firearms into the air behind that property. Um, so they waited. They saw several flashes. They saw these men. The men went inside the house. The officers called for backup. Once backup was there, around 15 to 20 minutes later, they were able to enter the property. They got consent from the owner or renter of the property to go in. They brought down approximately five young men who were in the upstairs second and third levels who were hiding in uh, closets. So the scene was secured for a search warrant. Identifications were made of the men who were outside versus inside by matching them to their clothing. So uh, Bashir Smith was wearing a gray zip-up Nike sweatshirt, and that is important. So these men were un uh, put under arrest. They were held. The scene was held. And then members of South Detectives came in and executed a search warrant several hours later. During the execution of that search warrant, they did not recover any firearms. But they did recover 12 spent uh, bullet casings or FCCs from the year, rear yard where the officers had seen these young men discharging firearms. And most importantly, the gray jacket that Bashir Moore was wearing was preserved, it was held, and it was submitted for gunshot residue testing. Uh, it was sent off to the Pennsylvania State Police Lab. Um, and so what I did when I had this case was unfortunately I did not have the firearm. It was never recovered. These guys had about 20 to 15 to 20 minutes to hide the firearm, so no gun recovered. But what we were able to do through the eyewitness testimony of the police officers who were there, through the spent FCCs, and then also, and most importantly, through the gunshot residue testing, we were able to link Bashir Moore to discharging the firearm, having the gunshot residue on him, and then, uh, you know, such and such. So we were able to successfully prosecute him for discharging this firearm on New Year's Eve um, in what is, quite frankly, a highly populated residential area. Um, so 
that's it. I just want to say a big thank you to officers McCord and McMahon from the first district, as well as detectives from South Detectives. And I would also like to thank uh, members from the Office of Forensic Science from Philadelphia, specifically Hung Lee. He's a trace analyst, and he was really, really helpful to have in my back pocket to explain uh, the, the gun residue analysis and basically be on standby. So as a line prosecutor, we do take these cases very seriously. There is a backlog, but I just want everyone to know that we are trying very diligently to get through that backlog and to hold people accountable. Um, and just make one last pitch. This case, we would not have gotten a, a guilty verdict without the forensic science in this case. So investing and continuing to invest in forensic science is really key. Thanks. Did you arrest anybody else? There were several other men who were arrested at that time. Uh, there was a primary co-defendant in this case. He subsequently passed away at a later event at a later time, so he was unavailable for prosecution. So really the only person that was left was Bashir Moore. Moore ever talk to you about that gun that he had, where that gun came from, any history on that weapon, or is it sort of in the ether? No information. He, we didn't have any statements or anything from him. And the gun residue, uh, you, you did that through Philadelphia Police Forensics, through the ATF? Where did, who helped you with that? So it was a bit of a joint effort. So the uh, sweatshirt was actually swabbed and the samples were taken by Hung Lee from the Philadelphia Office of Forensic Science. At that time in 2019, their machine was broken. So the samples were sent by the assigned detective to the Pennsylvania State Laboratory for um, analysis and then they were sent back. So anything else? This happened again, you said 19? Yes, New Year's Eve 2019. Where's he been? Have you been holding him or has he been out? Where's, where's, where was he? So he has been in custody because he, um, so, so this gentleman, he was on Judge Street's probation from a prior VUFA conviction, so 6106, 6108, carrying a firearm without a license. So when he was arrested on this, he had a detainer placed on him, so he's been in custody. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, um, I would also like to note, and no, I can't get into detail, uh, Moore and Smith are two different names that appear in the records with reference to this defendant, and also this is someone who we have reason to believe is associated with one or more of the groups that are driving gun violence in the city of Philadelphia. So the significance of the arrest goes beyond the immediate act. It goes to the reality that there are some people we need to focus upon. As we have said from the very, very beginning, we need to focus on the most dangerous people and we need to be effective in their prosecution as we are simultaneously working on the prevention of other crimes. Are there any questions about this or any other matter? Thank you, DA Krasner. Uh, no updates to report at this moment. Um, the, it's now been classified as a homicide, so the homicide department is uh, handling the job. Uh, they will take whatever information was gathered by the detectives who initially had the job and hopefully run with it. I would ask if anybody has any information about this case, please call the homicide unit 215-686-3334. <clears throat> you know, we notice every case and we pay close attention to it. I, can't, I cannot answer you with data that would tell you specifically whether we are seeing something that is extraordinary as compared to last year. I can tell you that every life that is taken, every defendant who is charged, all of these people, uh, we look at very carefully. We take those cases very seriously. I'm not trying to avoid your question, but I don't want to resort to what sometimes happens in the media, which is we just make grand statements based upon a couple cases that may or may not be correct. If you do have a more specific question about whatever it may be, uh, we would be happy to try to get you some data and give you an answer that's a little bit more serious than that. As for what we are doing, in our function as a prosecutor's office that goes to court to prosecute cases, we are always limited by the number of cases that are solved. 
And so when I explained that there were 83 arrests made in cases involving either gun possession or other gun crimes, we brought 82 of those cases. That's what we do. We always bring uh, what is essentially every single case where there's sufficient evidence to bring it, and that is some number close to 99 percent, 98 percent. So we bring them and we prosecute them vigorously within the limitations that we have. I think it is important, though, to note not only my stressing of the need for additional forensic resources, but also what you heard from ADA Steck. She hasn't been around all that long in the sense that she hasn't been in this office working as a prosecutor all that long. But it doesn't take long before you figure out that when your whole case hinges on gunshot residue, the machine shouldn't be broken, which is what it was when this incident happened. Thank goodness it's a little bit better now. There is more evidence that might have existed in this case, but we don't have the technology to do it. And I'm not going to give you all the specifics because I'm not here to give lessons to people who shoot guns on how they can avoid their detection. But there is more evidence that could have existed in this case and could exist in many other cases. What happened here is not brand new. It's not brand new that people run away, that the gun is hidden, that the case is a real challenge, and that you have to put it together in other ways, and you have to put it together beyond a reasonable doubt. So once again, I would like, in the spirit of true collaboration, to encourage federal, state, local authorities, find that 50 million bucks that we need for a state-of-the-art forensics lab that takes us from 47,000 square feet to 150,000 square feet, that takes us from being able to do really good forensics on a very limited basis to being able to do brand new modern forensics on a sweeping and comprehensive basis. A lot of this is not just about whether you can do a particular test in one case. It's about whether you can do that test in thousands of cases. You can do it over and over. You can take all of that information together. And so we could end up working together with a much higher level of success when it comes to solving these cases and having really strong cases for prosecution. Uh, the other thing I do want to point out is this is an example of police being very careful not to mess up the case. We have seen instances in the past, sadly, where uh, police took liberties and they searched a phone without a warrant and it blew up a homicide case. That didn't happen here. At every step, police were mindful to get permission, to get warrants, to move deliberately so they did not put this case in a bad place. So I want to con commend them for that because it is obviously tempting at times for police to just go ahead and grab everything, just go through the door, just do this, just do that. But when they do so in violation of the Constitution, they also jeopardize the case. So I want to commend them for having been very careful and deliberate in how they proceeded in terms of consent, in terms of warrants, in terms of what was necessary to make this a successful prosecution. Are there any other questions? Yeah, I have a number. Uh, is the forensic, is the residue machine fixed? Last thing I heard. Larry, they have new machines. Last thing I heard, there was a new machine. Um, okay. You know, look, I'm not, I'm not here to, to, to criticize. I'm here to say there are certain things we need to elevate as we take our police budget from 500 million to $1 billion in the space of eight years, as we double that, if not go even higher, can somebody please find 5% of one year's policing budget to do that, to make a first class city first class in the scope of its forensics? Can you tell us any more about the police officer who uh, has been fired for shooting the 12 year old in the back? Any, anywhere on, can you speak about that case? I can tell you, stay tuned. That I can tell you. Yeah. You, you said that don't believe the hype. This is a good office. Do you still believe that your office is being unfairly uh, painted in some way? It's, it's too loose on crime? Or I, th I think the facts speak for themselves. We, we had and we have uh, tremendous success when it comes to prosecuting gun violence. That's the truth. Uh, as you know, we happen to be in midterm elections where it seems to serve the purposes of certain candidates to uh, engage in what is really dog whistle coded conversation about big cities, about big diverse cities, about progressive prosecutors in big cities. Um,
So I guess if you're listening to Josh Hawley when he's not running an insurrection, you might hear that. Or if you listen to Ted Cruz, who doesn't even know how to defend his wife, you might hear that. Or if we're listening to Tom Cotton, who describes himself as a seventh generation agriculturalist from Arkansas, think about that for a minute. Tom, wish I was in the land of Cotton. If you're listening to them, yeah, you might hear some of that hype. But who in the state does that? <clears throat> Are there any other questions? I actually want to ask Bob Hunt, I know you kind of know this, but we have somebody else uh, working on the story. Um, as far as the teens, the 12 year olds that were charged with the assault on the, the I guess you can say assault on buddy, cat, the dogs, um, is there a program that's set up for kids generally or teens that when it comes to kind of this type of, we'll say, behavior? Or what do you guys do then? Like, what happens? Um, can you tell me a little bit more about which case you're referring to? Yeah, the buddy and cat case where the two teens were seen trying to uh, encouraging the dog to attack the cat. Um, at this point in time, I'm not aware of any specific program that we have to address that type of behavior. Um, however, um, we certainly will be looking into it as we go forward. This is a pretty rare occurrence from my point of view, what I've seen in terms of juvenile behavior. Judicatory hearings uh, at the uh, and family court, and the follow up on on that. Um, I'll certainly take a look into it, and if you have some further questions, be prepared to try and provide you with uh, more in depth answers on it. Okay, sure. Yeah, yeah, uh, you know, there certainly have been. Last great, question, Mr. Cole, yeah, and I say that respectfully. Last I understand question. Understand that? I understand. You certainly have, uh, in the past, uh, questioned the police department's clearance rate. Right? used 115, 83 arrests. They brought 83 of the 115. It's a pretty good clearance rate, right? You think? Um, that's not actually how it works, just so we're clear. Yeah. The, there were 115 gun-related incidents right. that occurred during this week. Right. The number of arrests that are made are often arrests for things that happened a long time ago. So they, may, they may have been three years ago, two years ago, or a couple of weeks. Um, I can certainly tell you I'm delighted that they made 83 arrests. Uh, and that we found that 82 of them were, were ones where we felt there was enough evidence to open it. I can say that. And listen, there's nothing I would rather see than uh, working together to improve that clearance rate, which is part of the reason I will just keep beating that drum of forensics. That, it makes such a difference. It is such a difference. And frankly, uh, there could hardly be a better investment in terms of enforcement than investment in that. Let's also understand something. The DA's office, which has a budget that is 4% of the police budget, is saying give money to the police for forensics, or at least use the money that's already there in a way that gives you the maximum return on your investment, as they say in business. That's what I'm saying. You know, we really are collaborating every way we can to see what we can do about gun violence. I just don't see anything that would be more effective at this time than further investment in forensics. All right. Mr. President, Any? my coworker is working on a different story out um, on Will Smith slapping his rock at the officers out in California. And he wanted to ask you, do you have any reaction to that incident? And do you think that, Will, that the Chris Rock should file charges against Will Smith? So it was a good day for Philadelphia at the Oscars. Will Smith won an Oscar. So did um, Questlove. Questlove won an Oscar for an absolutely wonderful documentary about uh, music festival in Harlem. That it has produced people who win Oscars and do amazing things. Um, I imagine that Will Smith and Chris Rock probably woke up this morning reconsidering their actions of yesterday. I hope they will give each other some grace. Maybe we should all give them a little bit of grace because as Brian Stevenson has said many times, you are not the worst thing you ever did. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. <clears throat>